Your people are your greatest asset in terms of running any type of business, not just an airport business, but any type of business. But in return for that, you've got to make sure your people are taken care of. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews of Kome. So let's get started. Hey, hey, guys, welcome back to the show. Today in the guest chair, I have someone who is going to blow your mind. She has blown my mind. So have you ever been in the airport, walked into a store or restaurant and wondered who owns it or how that particular store got such prime real estate? Well, today's guest will shed light on this industry, which I personally knew very little about. And I promise you, you will never look at an airport news gift shop, or restaurant the same way again. Her name is Mary Morgan, and she is the president of Morgan Group Ventures Incorporated. Mary has over 25 years of experience supporting airport infrastructure and traveler needs. This expertise includes retail, food, and beverage, and news and gift operations. Mary entered the airport arena initially as a consultant to the Metropolitan Washington Airport Authority, which then sparked an interest in airport concessions. So after five years of management consulting, Mary decided that she wanted to focus solely on concessions and obtained her first inline retail location, Pen and Pros Boutique, which she continues to operate today. Following five years of retail operations, Mary entered into a partnership with HMS Host, where she has been able to jointly bid, win, and operate food and beverage news and gift locations within airports. Today, Mary operates independently and in conjunction with HMS Host, multiple locations in National, Dulles, and BWI airports. Mary has also operated concessions in Philadelphia International Airport. Prior to founding Morgan Group Ventures, Mary worked in Fortune 100 companies, providing financial services, strategy, process redesign, and information technology services. She's also a CPA and received her BS in accounting from Virginia Commonwealth University and her MBA in finance and marketing from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School. Now, I don't usually read out everyone's full-length bio, but because... Again, Mary just blows my mind. I had to let you know where she's coming from. Mary shared a wealth of information on today's episode, and I'm excited for you to hear it. So let's get right into it. So welcome to the guest chair, Mary. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Now, this is one I am so excited about because, as you know, I had no idea about this world of airports before I met you. And I would love for you to share a little bit with the audience about your personal story. So what was your initial career path before creating Morgan Group Ventures? My initial career path upon graduating from undergraduate was to go into the financial services arena. I, um, right out of undergraduate, took the CPA exam and passed. And so I started out working in um, Fortune 100 in the finance department and decided that it was um, a critical critical component of running a business, but rather narrow. And from there, decided I wanted to go to graduate school and got an MBA in finance and marketing. Upon leaving graduate school, however, because I, I left the finance arena, because it was so narrow, I decided I wanted to do something broader, um, something that gave me a more holistic picture of the entire operation, not just the financial operation. So I went into management consulting and did that for about 12 years, initially as the assistant to the president of the organization and subsequently as a VP over a management unit, management consulting unit. And it's from there that I first got my exposure to airports and um, and many other industries, but specifically airports. But I, I um, wasn't ready to fully embrace the entrepreneurship role or the business owner role. So I decided to go into it in a small way, initially in a kiosk in, um, in the early mid-90s. 
but still worked and did consulting um, for a large non not for profit and business optimization and stayed there for about 17 years. But during that process, also maintained the um, kiosk, which quickly evolved into an inline store in the airport arena. Wow. And that's the beginning of my entry into the full fledged business owner's role. But as I said, I did the still worked for 17 years while I ran the business also. Right. That is incredible. 17 years. So once you were made aware of this whole world of airport retail commerce, what made you decide to go for it? You know, what inspired the pivot? Was it something about the opportunity that you just said, I have to get my, you know, get a piece of this pie? Well, you know, in many ways, I feel blessed because while I was still working, the business was actually growing. But it wasn't, it was growing with my vision, but not totally because I did work full time and I worked a lot of hours on both the the organization I was working for and in the company. But the business was evolving sort of with my vision and background a bit because I was subject to whoever was running the stores at that point in time. And there were stores and not just one and still had a few kiosks also. But It was sort of a push and pull. It was things weren't going with the organization the way I wanted them to go, and at least for me. And as I said, the business was still growing. And so it was a, you know, a storm, a perfect storm, quite honestly. So I decided, okay, it's, you know, I've had this business, and while I've been running it, I haven't been a totally active owner in it. And if it's growing without me being there full time, what can it do if I am there full time? And a lot of my financial commitments were a lot less at that point also in my life with kids and college and that sort of thing. Okay. Now let's take a little bit of a step back because I know for one, you know, I'm still wrapping my mind around all of this. So let's talk about just... Just what it takes. So what exactly, you know, break down what is Morgan Group Ventures and what was that initial first step you took to get into your first airport? Well, I'll take what is Morgan Group Ventures. Morgan Group Ventures has been set up to run airport concessions, which include specialty retail, news and food and beverage. And we do that in three airports, four airports, we have done it currently, but at this point, three airports. And we are involved in over 25 different units between those airports. And so in a nutshell, that's Morgan Group Ventures. We we look for opportunities to have either kiosks or basically inline stores, and that we have more of those than anything, in airports throughout the world, not just the U.S., the world. And we have had many, many, many requests to come into airports, but because of my dedication to the purity of the concept, for lack of a better word, and the the quality with which we do business and how we do business, I've resisted going out there too fast. But as I said, we're in 25 locations at present. Wow. Now, how I into the um, airport arena is by being a consultant. And as I said, working for the airport while I was working with a management consulting firm. And I had the opportunity at that point to get an insight into the infrastructure of airports. I never knew airports leased out these spaces. I thought they were all run by the airport directly. But by being a consultant to the airport, I got a behind the scenes look at what airports need and how profitable it can be. But I I don't want to give a false image here. It can be profitable, but it's also very expensive. So you need to really do your research in terms of if you, this is an arena you want to go into, you need to really understand it and understand the holistic view of doing business in an airport. Um, You know, where you're located, what airlines fly into that location? What are the demographics of the passengers? So I got into it because I had this insight, this rare insight, behind the scenes insight. But I also had to do my own research for what works where. You know, some of my concept, uh, it requires you have, you know, a fair amount of discretionary income. 
those those concepts can go certain places that others may not work. So it, I got into it through connections and relationships and and doing a lot of research, but you really need to understand what you're jumping into. It's not just having the access or the, the entree, but it's really doing the research and the hard work to make sure you have the best possibility of success. So, you know, is it like a request for proposal? You know, there's a new space opening and who hears about it? Who can apply for these? Let's say you have the capital. How do you even hear about openings or opportunities? Well, one thing that most people don't know about airports is that under a federal requirement, a certain percentage of all airport contracts or RFPs require a minority percentage of participation on them. Now, I didn't go into it that way because I really wasn't as much up on that as I should have been, but I went in on my own for five years. I didn't do any partnerships. I was on my own, so I really learned the hard way. But it's, anybody can do business in an airport, and if you are a minority woman, I suggest that you get certified because they have they know about these minority companies through their certification programs. And once you're certified in an airport, you automatically get put on a mailer for most requirements. And these could be for construction. It could be for paving. It could be not just the concessions. The airport really contracts out almost everything they do, the janitorial services, the parking lots, operation of the parking lots. So you get put on a list where you see you specify your area of interest. Mine is specifically concessions, but I can do other things. So the concessions being the stores, but um, you get put on a list. And when there are requirements or when a new space opens up, more than likely you'll get a request for a proposal. However, not everything goes that direction. Again, it really is about relationships and contacts. 99% probably go the direction I've already described. But by virtue of staying in touch with the groups or departments within the airport that lets these RFPs or has manages the vacancies in an airport, you will learn about some things that aren't put out to the public as a whole based on um, looking for a certain type of expertise that already exists in an airport that they want to exploit even further. So most things come out in RFPs, but not everything. And you get those requests by becoming um, certified. My, I, um, they call it ACDBE certification with an airport. And, you get, and every airport has one of those programs. How did you choose your initial airport? Was it strictly based on where you were living and the airport you were most familiar with? It was where I was living, yes, at that point, because as I said, the quality and the, with the execution of my concepts was very important to me. And being that I was working full time also, I couldn't just take off and fly across the country to go do something in San Francisco's airport and do it the way I wanted it to be done. So it was based on the logistics of where I lived and how much impact I could have on the business. And that required you know, proximity, close proximity. You know, what's so interesting to me, Mary, is even though you had this exposure from working as a management consultant, there were still so many questions that you had to answer. For example, you decided to do concessions, but what kind of concessions? How did you decide what kind of retail concession that you wanted to open, especially given the fact that you were not doing this before? You were not selling anything before. So you go from being a consultant to now being a business owner and also entering into this new territory? Yes, I, I would have to say, you know, my graduate degree and my undergraduate degree prepared me well, also my work experience, to understand that I had the basics of what I needed and to run all facets of the business. And you're right, I hadn't done any sort of retail establishment before um, going into the airport. It's a lot harder today to do this than when I entered the business in 1996. So I would say, you know, unless you, you have to be really persistent. They didn't just hand me the store. I had to 
continually follow up and be told, no, you know, you're probably not going to get a store. But in the end, I did get a store in the prime location in the airport. So as I said, the persistence and the research and, and being credible when you go in to talk to someone so that they understand that you understand what you're getting into is critically important. In terms of my initial concept, you know, I knew it would be a lot harder for me to go directly into food or news because the, the, the investment is so much higher but also the learning curve is much steeper. Now, I would have to say, even though I had never done business before um, as an entrepreneur, I loved stationery and pens. I love, well, I loved stationery, let me say. And so I had an, a thought always of perhaps owning a Hallmark. But as I looked at this and thought about it more I, and did my research, I realized going in that direction didn't necessarily make sense for me in an airport, that the boutique concept was going to work a lot better, in my opinion. And I did the research on stationery. I did the research on writing instruments. And the numbers were impressive for the nation as a whole and the growth rate of those industries. And then I looked at the customer and that we were in an airport and what sort of things might they want that, you know, they might not get from any other shops. And at that point in time, the airports were just becoming these malls. The mall concept for the airport was just evolving. So you didn't have a lot of variety in terms of the types of things that you could buy in an airport. It was just starting. And this was the beginning of the Washington, D.C. airports in terms of their entree into this mall concept. And so a lot of the stores that came in at the same time I did, because this was a new terminal, National Airport, were big businesses like Gap and Bath and Body and Victoria's Secrets. So people knew those concepts, but my concept, I had to compete against those individuals. And what I decided was I was going to go for things that were unique, things that were handmade, things that um, had name recognition as being top of the line because my clientele is primarily a clientele with a fair amount of disposable income. But I wanted to have something for a, a little bit of something for everybody. And so it was using the stationery and the writing pens as the base product, but also looking at things that were aligned with it, um, executive gifts, briefcases, portfolios, organizers, um, you know, desk accessories. Um, so those, though, you know, I filled in, but not only did I fill in with those things and some known brands like Moleskin and, and um, Let's and other brands that would be known to a, a pen enthusiast or a stationary enthusiast, but I also went with things that were imported, that were handmade, that you just couldn't find anywhere else or you didn't see in a lot of places. And that's been what has enabled me to, um, to, to be in this business as long as I have. People say every day they come into the store because they want to see what's new. And they ask, where can I find one of these in my state? But it's, it's the uniqueness of the merchandise that we carry that keep people coming back. And I am, even though I've been in business now 22 years, every day, every week, every year, not only is my management team always looking for new product, I am always looking for new product. I have not slowed down. I still go to the gift shows. I still want to know what's new and inventive in the industry. So I try to stay on top of what everybody else doesn't have or what very select number of people have. We recently were licensed by Vera Bradley to carry their product. Now, Vera Bradley is very widely known. But we pick and choose. We're within the line. We don't carry the whole line. We, we're we very selective about the things out of the line that we carry. First, because we're an airport store, and you can't carry big merchandise when you're getting on a plane after you've gone through security. Um, and, and secondly, because it keeps our customers coming back. So we, we are very specialized. Things you might find, you know, we have stationery from England. We have stationery from Germany. We carry crane papers, which people know in the U.S. widely know. So that's what we do. And it's interesting that you mention the license from Vera Bradley. I never thought about that now. You know, I expected it to be kind of just like a straightforward buyer and sell situation. So you have to 
individually go to these brands, get the license to even carry them in the concession shop? Absolutely. For the big brands, yes. They have to decide if they want you, if you represent their product the way they want to be represented. I have a C's Candies license also out of California and Seiko and, and a number of different big brands. But it's not that, you know, smaller products that are not as well known, yes, you will be able to just go buy them wholesale. Big name products, absolutely, you have to be licensed to carry it. And they may or may not decide to sell you their product. It's very interesting um, how we we um, actually landed on getting their Bradley. We had applied, applied, applied. They weren't sure. And then apparently not too long ago, one of their executives was walking through National Airport, unbeknownst to me or anyone in the store, and um, came into the store and said to his team when he got back, hmm, I, I have to wonder why we're not in that store and I want to be in that store. Wow. <laughs> so, quite a compliment to us. <laughs> and um but but just tells you how hard it is sometimes to get these big name brands. There are some that won't sell to us. But um in the pen arena we have almost all of them. But um as you go outside of that and and some in the stationary arena that won't sell to us. They have a very exclusive representation in the retail market. And they, even though my store is at the top of the heap, if you ask me, my boutiques for um, stationery and writing pens, but they are very specific in terms of how they want to portray their brand. And as you deal with the larger brands, that's the case almost across the board. They, You just can't say, I want your product. They want to come, take pictures of your store, discuss it with their team, decide if it's an appropriate mix with everything else you have in the store. It gets very complicated. You mentioned that you didn't want to just dive right into food. You knew it would be a harder learning curve. Can you talk about what are the different type of businesses you now run in the airport? What are all the different categories? Sure. In the airports, and this is the Washington, D.C. airports um, specifically, because as you go to each airport, has their own concept in their head of what they want and who they may even want to run it because many airports want to patronize the local business owner, uh, just as national adults are very good at doing that with a select number of um, entrepreneurs. But in terms of the food, we are partnered, and that's one what we do partner. We're partnered in Starbucks in select airports. Um, we are partnered on a Redskins theme, on Caravas, District Chop House, Capnos. We have probably at least 12 different restaurants, multiple units sometimes. Starbucks, we have probably over 10 partnerships in Starbucks. So those are some of the primary brands that we have in the food. When you say partnership, is this kind of like a franchise situation where they approach you or do you approach them and then you kind of have the license to run these? Right. Well, our partnership is with a large company that has the license to run these operations. The license, the franchise fees can be one of many, many charges that you would incur in terms of operating a food location. Um, first of all, you have to go in and, you know, present a design to the airport as part of your bid if you were bidding on a food concept. And then once your bid is accepted, you've got to build it from scratch, nine times out of 10. Sometimes you come into a space that you could just refurbish and make minor changes, but most airports don't want that. Generally, it's a total tear down and build up from scratch of a location. So you, you bid the design, you bid, and not only does the airport have to approve it, the franchise, if you were dealing with a pup, they've got to approve it also. But it is a, a franchise situation where, in all of my cases at this point, we are partnered with a large um, company that has the, the franchise license already, and we agree that we're going to, or they're going to get it, we're going to bid it for a particular location, and we just bring it up from the ground if and when we win. Hey guys, it's Nikayla with a quick word from our sponsor. 
Okay, I have a side hustle hack for all to hear, and it's called Skillshare. You want to know how I grow as a businesswoman? I keep learning. There's not a week that goes by that I'm not checking out a refresher class or a deep dive tutorial. And my go-to is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform with over 18,000 classes in business, marketing, entrepreneurship, you name it. So whether you're trying to start a side hustle or scale your business, Skillshare is there to keep you learning and thriving. In the last month alone, I've learned how to set up my email capture landing page on Squarespace and how to boost my email marketing using MailChimp, all through Skillshare. And now, Skillshare has a special offer just for my listeners. Get two months of Skillshare for just 99 cents. That's right, just 99 cents. To sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash Hustle Pro. Again, go to Skillshare.com slash Hustle Pro to start your two months now. Speaking of these large companies, now something we touched on, but I really want to learn more about is the financial aspect of this. Now, you know, it can seem a little daunting for someone who's hearing about this now, right? We we didn't get in on the opportunity in 1996. However, we are interested in working towards that level. So I've heard you say that most right. people in the airport business are very wealthy and have been in it for a long time. Now, how did you go about raising that initial capital to make your first go at setting up this first location? Sure. And I'm going to go back from very wealthy. You have a lot of large companies that have been doing this longer than I have, much longer than I have. And they specialize in the airport arena, Hudson News, for instance, or HMS Hosts or Marriott or Parities. Those are companies that have been in this business probably triple the number of years that I've been in it. <laughs> and they've made a lot of money at it. But these are huge entities. Individuals that I know that have gone into this business also, I know as many that have not been able to succeed in the airport as I know who have made substantial money, but it's an up and down. You know, you may lose on one airport and you're gaining on another airport. So I I don't want to give the impression that, you know, just money pouring from everywhere because it is a very expensive um, entry fee to get into this, this game. And I say it as a fee, but the barriers to entry can be quite high. So I don't want to mislead anybody to think, oh, you just get in and make all this money. In the beginning, though, for me, because I didn't have a partner, I didn't even know about the partners at that point in time. I just knew I wanted a business there and I just wanted to open a business in the airport. So I did that by doing a couple of things. One, taking out an SBA loan and um, putting a second on mortgage on my home in order to do that as collateral for the loan. And then I used personal funds also. Um, That was one of the main reasons actually why I did not quit my day job because I needed to make sure that my staff in the airport were going to be taken care of, that their benefits would be taken care of, that I could operate and compete with anybody in the airport, quite honestly, for a space. So I used personal funds for many, many years, funds that I could have kept in my family to fund the business itself because your people are your greatest asset in terms of running any type of business, not just an airport business, but any type of business. But in return for that, you've got to make sure your people are taken care of. I had to make sure I always had enough inventory, didn't want the shelves to go bare, did not want this to look like it was being run by a minority. I wanted it to look like any other space in an airport. And and I have accomplished that. I've accomplished that from day one. I don't know if I should consider it a compliment or an insult, but people often say, my God, we didn't know this was a minority-owned business. And I often think, and I don't know why you should. So, <laughs> right. But it took, and I get that all the time when people find out because I'm not out front saying, this is my business. That's not important to me. What's important to me is we put forward our best foot and that we look just like any other business in the airport. But it, it took a combination of loans, putting a second on my home and personal funds to do the initial inline store in the airport. Now, is it still, I believe I heard you say it was about 
half a million to a million today to open any store in the airport? Is that still correct? Retail. 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 And it can be upwards of a half a million dollars. I'm not going to cap it at seven. It depends on your concept. But if you're doing an inline retail space of about 800 square feet or more, 800 starting, maybe a little bit less, it's going to cost you more than likely somewhere about a quarter of a million to open the doors. Bare minimum. Bare minimum. Okay. Because the individuals who come in and do the build out requires certain bonding that you don't in other organizations or in other locations. And so there's a premium for that. That's a premium for the fact that they can't really do a lot of the work during the core hours of the day. There are premiums for everything associated with the build out in an airport. And, uh, you know, you're open 365 days a year, 15 hours a day. So there is a lot that entails opening a business in an airport and the durability of the the materials that you use because you've got so much passenger traffic coming through, millions of people per year. Speaking of that foot traffic, now, once you actually open a store and let's say you are in a prime location, is foot traffic enough? Do you have to do anything beyond that to market and really make sure that you are meeting your financial goals? Your marketing for airports is is generally in the airport itself. And um, I think the things you, you, you really need to focus on to ensure that you're getting people in because the dynamics of getting individuals and customers into an airport store and actually consummating a sale are very different from something on the street. You Individuals in an airport have a limited amount of time. So you need to have products that are that catch the eye, that are unusual, that are different from everything else that they're going to see. It also goes back to understanding your foot traffic that, that passes in front of your door. People just don't, you know, come in and think, oh, I want to shop in an airport. You've got to capture the imagination. But marketing is very different from being outside of an airport. There are no place we put ads and billboards and that sort of thing just as an exaggeration to get people to come into our store. It all happens in the airport. And it happens by you catching the customer's eye. You've got to attract their attention against many other competing forces around them. TSA, you know, they, people have come through TSA, they're often stressed. <laughs> or they're going through the TSA yes. to be screened. And, you know, they don't want you blocking. They look at the line and they may be thinking they're coming in your store, but they see the line. And they immediately decide, I'm not shopping today. So it's really the product mix, um, the concept. It has to catch the customer. And then you have to give them good customer service when they're in the store and get them in and out as quickly as you can, spending as much money as you can get them to spend while they you have their attention. Right. You have to think through that entire door-to-door experience of how to keep that flow going. Absolutely. Now, one thing I... I definitely hear you mentioning, and I know it's really important, is the location. And I've heard you say that, you know, you can fail if you have gotten a location in a bad terminal, you know, foot traffic is reduced in that terminal. But what do you do when you really want to break into airports? You have finally, you know, secured a location and then you find out it's not the best location. Should you pass up on it altogether or, you know, try to get your foot in the door? Well, it depends on your financial situation and what your long-term goals are. Some things, you know, you should pass on, definitely, because (laughs) if someone is chasing you for a space and you're new in the business, unless you have an incredible concept, that maybe should tell you something, (laughs) Um, because certain spaces are just hard to lease. And you you could go into a space that is great, But due to circumstances outside of your control, something could happen. A major airline that's an anchor airline for that airport decides that they're moving to a different gate altogether. And 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 it's a gate that's not near you. There goes your foot traffic. So, um, you know, you you have to do the research. You have to do the research about where are these passengers flying to because all of your night, percent probably of your purchases are by passengers that are getting on a plane as opposed to passengers getting off of a plane because people don't stop. You, you think about your travel patterns. When you're coming home, all you want to do is get your luggage. You don't want to go shop anywhere and get out. But 
it's the passengers that are getting on the airlines that are buying by and large and the visitors who are coming to wait for them. So you need to understand what are, what are the what are the demographics of that passenger? You know, is it a passenger going to Asia? Is it a passenger going to the Middle East? Is it a passenger going to the islands? Is it a vacation passenger? They all have different buying dynamics that tells you something about the type of business you want in that terminal. Is it an affluent passenger? Is it a passenger that doesn't visit the U.S. often? And if they do, do or do they want the really tchotchke souvenir things, you know? So all those things you have to take into account in terms of looking at a location and how much passenger traffic flow are you getting at those gates if you're in, you know, past security and in a terminal, how much actual foot traffic is coming through that gate as opposed to other gates in the airport. So, it, it, you know, whether or not you should accept a deal just to get your foot in the door depends. Do you have the disposable income to sit there and not make a lot of money or to lose money? for a period of time. Now, if you are in a terminal that was really good, that goes to being bad because the airline decided they were moving to a different gate, which happens more often than you would think, the, luckily the airports will work with you in those kinds of situations to put you somewhere else. But that may not be quick, and sometimes it's not even possible. So you usually in that situation would get the option of, do you want to continue the lease if the airport is flexible or do you just want to not do that anymore? Now, luckily, airline gates don't stay open for long. If one airline moves, another airline generally is always coming in. The question is who and when. So those are if-then sort of questions you have to weigh. Now, speaking of if-then, you were operating during September 11th when the airport was closed for, I believe, 21 days, I've heard you say. Talk a little bit about that and, and how you survived that experience. Well, I initially, I wasn't quite sure that I could. And, you know, the insurance companies weren't really rushing forward to pay anybody. I didn't get any insurance. You know, no one had insurance coverage against that type of an incident. So there was no real insurance that came forward payments as a result. And it was a really weird period of time going through the airports and hearing the recordings, but there are no passengers in the airport at all. And I was really concerned because I have a good team of people. I've always been blessed to have a good team of people working for me. I was really concerned of how I was going to keep people during that period of time when I had no income coming in. And fortunately, I was able to keep people on the payroll for those days that we were closed and even subsequently because we didn't initially go directly back from zero to normal operations. It took years for that to happen. But I was fortunate enough to be able to keep my people on payroll during my critical people during that period of time and make sure that they had income coming in. Just as I needed it, they needed it also. And that's where the job really helped out because I was funneling in income from my job to the business. And for many, many years, it went that way that I was taking money from my actual working full time for a company and putting it back into the business. I was, even though there was money in the good times, I was not taking that money out and using it to support my lifestyle. I was using it to build the business. It was, I was re reinvesting it. Got it. I was just about to ask that. You've mentioned a lot that seems like quite a deal of personal sacrifice. How are you able to sustain your family life, your household, and explain, you know, that you were making money, but a lot of it was going into this business. Were you able to bring your family on board with the long-term vision? Well, luckily I have a very supportive husband and um, he had to pick up a lot of the, the things that, um, you know, by himself that normally would have been shared. When I started this business, my children were very young. My daughter had just been born and um, my son was two years old. So I had babies, really. And in many cases, it was not just the personal sacrifice, it was the the sacrifice of not spending time with the family, not being there for the kids' first steps and those kind of things because I was working. 
it, it, it was not only a sacrifice of money and family time, but it was a sacrifice of even health because luckily I'm not a person that requires a lot of sleep. So for most of the 17 years that I did both work and run the work outside the business and run the business, I was going on, you know, three, four, five hours of sleep a night, mostly four or less. And so it was the sacrifice in terms of my own health, although I didn't consider it that. That's just the way I function. So there are a lot of personal sacrifices. I mentioned for the first deal that I did for the boutique of putting my home up as a second as collateral on the loan. I never, in the early days, I wasn't even sure if my kids, if things went badly, would have a roof over their head. But it was something I felt strongly enough about to continue moving forward. And luckily, I've been blessed enough not to have to worry about those kind of things because I've always pushed and my husband has pushed and we've just made it all work. But there is a lot of sacrifice. So I would say one other thing, you need to really believe in your concept, be in love with your concept, but be realistic enough to know when you need to change that concept because it's not working or, or modified in some way. Because in any business that you own, you will have to sacrifice. They say the first five years are the most critical and most businesses die within the first five years if they're going to not succeed. And um, I feel like every day I have to be mindful of the fact that today is good, but you need to also prepare for tomorrow. You need to be on your game about what's new and what's innovative and what the customer wants and what deal am I going after next? You have to be strategic. For someone who wants to get started today, what should aspiring small businesses know before they go on this path? You know, everything from money to the work labor laws that might impact them if they haven't even thought about that. Mm hmm. Well, I, again, it's to do your research. When I started out in the airport game, there were no requirements about wage and unions and those sorts of things. There are now. It varies from airport to airport. You need to, you know, do your research. Reach out and talk to people in airports, and especially the people that manage the concessions. They are willing to talk to you, but if you're coming in, don't waste their time. They, you know, you're only going to get one shot at this more than likely. So know what you're talking about. Do your research before you come in and, you know, want to have a meeting with someone that can give you a contract or not. Know what you're talking about because the airport concession management team does not really want you to come in and say, what should I open? They want you to come in and say, this is my idea. This is what I want to do. And this is why I think it will work here. Be prepared. That's the main thing I can say. And be prepared and know about the full spectrum of operations. As much as you can, reach out and talk to people. Develop those relationships, even if you're not there. Because when something comes up, if you've been in and you've talked to people and they know you and they know you're credible and they know you have a plan and you can execute, they will think about you. And it may be that what was going out as an open RFP may come directly to you because you've been in there. You've been talking to people. Your name comes up. What about so-and-so? Or you'll be on a short list of bidders at the very least. So that's what I would say. Know your, what you're talking about. Cultivate relationships. Do your research. Speaking of the cultivating relationships, you mentioned that you work with a bigger partner who has cultivated the franchise relationships and the food and beverage locations that you've partnered on. Is there any way, how do you even approach those type of relationships? Is it just something that you have to be doing the work, talking to people while you're actually on the ground in the airport to start those networks or are there organizations that you can join? Well, I think, you know, all of the above is what I'd say. The company that I, I'm partnered with is very large. Uh, they've been in this game for probably 50 years, I have, if I had to guess, 40 at least. So the reason my relationship developed with them is because I was in an area they were not in. I was in um, retail. They were in food. 
And I had a good relationship and a good reputation at the airport for what I did. They were bigger, but I was in an area that they weren't, and I had a good reputation. And I had worked with some of the people within that firm, and I left a good impression with them. So you can do it through organizations or associations within the industry and attending those. Um, There's one called AMAC for Minorities, and it's um, the Airport Minority Advisory Council. You could join AMAC if this is a serious interest of yours. It does cost. But if you're serious, it may, I think it's like five, $600 a year. They do a conference every year. It's coming up. All the airports, um, representatives from all the airports are there, including all the major contractors who do business in airports. And some people are there exploring and learning. Most of the people that are there are in the business already. So you, And then there are franchises that, that are there that are giving out information about how you franchise with them, how you get a franchise license. So you can get the information in a number of ways. These associations, by going in and talk to the people who lease the space, by talking to current vendors in the airport. But it really, the way I came to it is through being there five years on my own, doing a good job and having a good reputation. And as they were seeking out partners, I'm sure my name came up in some conversation somewhere. Plus, I'd already had some Um, interaction with some of the people in that company. Okay, so this is unusual. You know, usually we get right into when you made the leap, but I guess it's kind of fitting because you worked for 17 years before you eventually went full-time. So when did you finally decide to leave your one of your full-time jobs to focus on Morgan Group (laughs) Ventures completely? And how did you know that it was time? And I I would not advise that Others do it this way. That was just the way it it happened with me. And um, as I said, it was a it was a number of pushes actually. One was that the company that I was working for with was going in a different direction than I wanted to go. My business was growing, and it needed my full time attention. And that probably happened in about year ten, quite honestly, or before that. But this is what I felt that I had to do to financially be able to continue the operation the way I wanted it to run. And, um, you know, I was giving both of them the job and the business a lot of time. I mean, I was probably working 12 hours for the business and another, you know, 10 for the company. So as I said, didn't leave a lot of sleep time. I worked seven days a week, didn't have a lot of free time, quite honestly. But it was just that the the business was growing and the company I was working for was going in a different direction. And I probably started to see that around year 12. It wasn't year 17 for sure. But um, I, I had hired people at senior levels to run the business, and we kept in close contact. But those people changed over. Um, more times than I would have liked. And so in about probably year 12, I started to know that this would have to change. It was setting up a plan to execute, really. The plan was already in place before things started to go in a different direction with the job, but I just hadn't executed. And then so the last five years were really planning for an execution. But it wasn't that the business was running on its own. I did have very good people at senior levels who were managing the locations and who I was in contact with constantly. And I maintained also all of the contract signing, bank account relationships. I was involved in the marketing, um, vendor relationships. I still maintain control of all of those things. Amazing. I mean, I just don't know how you do it. <laughs> Did it do it? Continue. It was, that was what my doctor says. The same thing. Um, <laughs> so anyway. Um, now, in hindsight, looking back, is there anything you would have done differently, and you would advise those seeking to follow your path to do differently? I probably would have left the corporate world earlier, but not sure if the outcome would have been the same, you know, it could have gone in a totally different direction. You can grow too fast and, you know, everything can fall apart. And I think that's what 
perhaps would have happened. This approach has caused me to be more focused. However, I probably would not have stayed in the corporate world working for someone else, in the business world working for someone else, as long as I did. But for me, it made sense and it worked. Now, I have grown slower as a result, but it's been in some ways a very controlled growth so that I don't lose sleep at night wondering where's the money going to come from for this next deal? Where's the money going to come from for the midterm renovation that are required in airports, which are very expensive also? Um, You know, where's the money going to come from for these benefits or the wage increases that are mandated by the airport? So it has given me some level of peace. I won't say total peace, but I probably would come out sooner than I did out of the um, business, out of working for someone else. And what's the future? What do you have your sights set on doing with Morgan Group Ventures over the next few years? Definitely to expand into other airports. I would love to be in the duty-free arena and perhaps to be in an international airport, a large international airport. I would really like to do that over the next few years. But also, very recently, I've started looking at buying another business that's larger than I am even, and in a totally different field than what I'm in. And I can't say a lot about it because we are in an NDA negotiation, um, non-disclosure agreement negotiation at this point. So I have to be careful how much I say about it, but it is another untapped field for women and minorities in particular. And so I'm very excited about that possibility, hoping it will move forward. As I said, it is a business that's been in place um, even longer than mine and is larger than my business. Ooh, I'm very excited as well. <laughs> okay, now we, <laughs> we are going to transition to the lightning round where basically you just answer the first thing that comes to mind to these five questions. You got it? Okay. Number one, what is a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? I would have to say the relationships I've been able to forge over the years um, in in many, many different arenas that have come to bear, but have ultimately been helpful in my airport business. Number two, what's been the best business book or podcast episode or live event that you've consumed this year? I would have to say it's um, a trade association that is ARN, Airport Revenue News. And it's where um, individuals that are that do work, whether it's contracting or airport officials or franchisees, they all convene at this conference with the interest of doing business. So that would be one that I would point to, at least for this year. There are others, but there's still trade associations. But that's one for the current year. Number three, who is a Black woman entrepreneur that you admire and would want to trade places with for a day, and why? Um, I've had to think a bit about this. I've thought a bit about it over the years, and there are many amazing women out there, but in terms of someone who has been an entrepreneur for many years and has accomplished great things, I would have to say Kathy Hughes. Um, And the reason why is that she, in a time where this was not done, she's the founder of Radio TV One. Many people might not know, but she was a teen mom. She was also, and I, and I, and as I said, I've looked into this because I've thought about this question many, many different times. And um, she was the first woman to own a radio station, right, in the top in major markets. She was the first African American woman to head a publicly traded company. And another thing that many people might not know is that she lectured at Howard University and um, she never completed college. She attended, but she never completed. Now, I'm sure she's been given honorary degrees over the years or may have gone back at this point. But at a point in time, very far into her career, she had never completed college. Yes, that's someone I definitely admire as well. Number four, what is a personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? Um, And and it's hard to boil that down to one habit and and one I consider my tenacity in that 
I don't take no easily. I don't like to hear no. It's hard for me to take no as an answer. And also sacrifice, probably the one that I'm not sure that I like very much, but a habit of being willing to sacrifice for the goal at the end of the road. And finally, number five, what is your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing that steady paycheck? I would advise that you need to be confident and really in love with whatever you're going after, whatever concept, whatever type of business you want to do, but not to the excess and not to be blind to something that you may be in love with, but nobody else is. And I, as I've said before in the podcast, do the homework, do the homework. You know, I think you really need to do these two things because if you really believe in your concept, you're not going to ultimately be happy doing anything else, not the extent of happiness that you will you will get from doing a business or a concept of your own. And it's not always about the money. It's not always about making a fortune. You know, it, it's about doing what you ultimately love. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for being here, for sharing your wisdom. It has been a pleasure to do this. Thank you for asking me. It's good to be able to pass the knowledge that I have on to someone else, and hopefully it will be helpful. All righty, and there you have it. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you want to hear more from me, head on over to sidehustlepro.co forward slash side hustle corner to get my weekly side hustle diaries chronicles about my own journey from passion project to profitable business. And if you want to find me online, I'm at Side Hustle Pro on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to join the Side Hustle Pro Facebook community. Go to sidehustlepro.co forward slash mastermind. And as always, if you love the show, do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks, guys. Talk to you next week. Thank you.